I want to talk to you this afternoon about the goodness of God. You know, it was, um, it was the relationship between God and Moses <clears throat> that first gave us the, re the revelation that glory and goodness were bound together in the heart of God. In um, Exodus chapter 33, so get ready, I'm opening the Bible. <laughs> In Exodus 33, I think, um, you ever have those situations where you know that God is maneuvering you into a place where you can ask him for the thing he most wants to give you? You ever had that encounter, that experience with God? And you know that he's just like dancing you all over the room just to get you into that corner where you just suddenly squeak out, show me your glory. <laughs> you know? And it doesn't matter to him how you say it as long as you say it. It doesn't matter if you sound like Pee Wee Herman on steroids. It doesn't matter at all. And so he gets Moses to the place where he says this, <clears throat> Exodus 33, uh, 18. Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And God said to him, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. That would be a lot of goodness. I imagine he was up there for quite a while. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. <clears throat> but the Lord said, you can't see my face, for no man can see me and live. It's not because there's any kind of threat attached to it. It's just that the face of God is so, the presence of God is so blindingly brilliant, it would incinerate anybody if they got in front of God in their natural state. You know, when Jesus comes back and those who go up in the air to meet him, they're going to be changed. Otherwise, they would arrive in heaven like a burnt crisp. So, you'd be a real burnt offering right there. <laughs> no man can see my face and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place with me, and you shall stand there in the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Why is that necessary? Because the goodness of God is so blindingly astonishing, Moses would literally go up in a puff of smoke. He would be incinerated. So I find it fascinating that God is saying, my goodness is so powerful, I'm going to have to protect you for it while you're in that state. <laughs> I thought that was good anyway. <laughs> then I'll take my hand away, and you can see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So Moses has an encounter with goodness <clears throat> that was so powerful, it made his face shine with such a radiance that in public he had to live with a veil over his face. This is the Old Testament. This was in a visitational culture. Encounters like that, so incredible. They border on fantasy almost. And that's the thing for me about the gospel. It is such astonishing good news, so astounding, so amazing, so incredible, it borders on fantasy. You know, we have um, a pessimistic saying in the world that if something is too good to be true, someone's being conned. Yeah? But in the kingdom, if it's not too good to be true, it's not God. The gospel is so bright, so shining, so astonishing, 
so incredible, so amazing. When you connect with it, it can take you to places in the realm of God that you're going to need an imagination to access. Just to even think about it. You can't think about those things logically. There is a point where your spirituality has to go way beyond your intellect. And you can only access that way of thinking through wisdom, through revelation, through encounter, through, through imagination with God. The reason God gave you an imagination and the reason that He speaks to people in dreams and visions is because those things are not based in any kind of logic or rationale. But they open you up to a realm of thinking that logic is incapable of getting to. Let me read you Exodus 34, verse 29. When Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterwards, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. It's interesting how that whole juxtaposition, how that whole thing gets turned around. You know, um, we go into places of hiddenness with God, you know, because God works by hiddenness and manifestation. And so there are times in manifestation, God invades your world and shows up big time and you're changed. But in hiddenness, He pulls you into His world. It's fascinating to me that Moses had to hide his face in private, in public, but he could have an open face with God in private. It's like a complete switcheroo right there. So, the glory and the goodness of God was so strong that Moses needed to be protected in his earthly state from the power of it by the hand of God. Just that thought alone like resonate so deeply in my spirit that, guys, we have got a really good ways to go. But it's a good way to go. I mean, if you're going to die, get incinerated by goodness. <laughs> the glory of God is in His unending goodness. And His goodness and His glory must fill the earth even as it fills heaven. We're looking in these days, our whole reason for being in the kingdom is to have a lifestyle that says, on earth as it is in heaven. We want the same reality on earth that heaven is enjoying because that's what Jesus came to give us. He came to give us a glimpse of what the kingdom really is like. He came to give us a taster. And then he said, greater things than these will you do. God's passion for goodness is so strong, it changes who comes into contact with it. David knew that... From his encounters with God, he knew that goodness was following him all the days of his life. 
And he wrote about it in his journal in the Psalms 23, 6. He knew that goodness was the antidote to despair. Psalm 27, 13. I would have despaired unless I have believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What if all your emotions, therefore, actually arise out of goodness so that we're not actually vulnerable to things going on in the world that can affect us adversely, but we're taking our cue from one place and one place only. All my emotions can rise up out of the place of goodness because the goodness of God overcomes everything that's negative and would cause me to despair personally. Romans 2 verse 4 says that the goodness of God is what leads people to repentance. Goodness enables every one of us to change our thinking, to think differently, to live a different way, to pursue a different way, to explore a different dimension of spirituality. Goodness empowers us. All people that are touched by God's goodness come into a deeper place of encounter with Him. What would it look like for you to encounter this incomparable goodness of God to such a degree it totally changed your personality? Your whole identity was adjusted. Your whole identity was free to go to the level of God's permission because in your life you'd come to a place where you were being ruled by one thing, by the goodness of God. Psalm 31.9 says that God has stored up goodness for each of His beloved children who revere Him. So I guess you've got some upgrades coming. You know, there's a storehouse in heaven that's got your name on it, and it's full of goodness. If you're going to believe something about God, believe something outrageous. Believe something out of the ordinary. Don't believe for the ordinary stuff. Believe for something lavish, something generous, something huge. So it's important for you as an individual and for your family and for your family line that you understand there is a huge deposit of goodness that has your name on it. It's important that we don't just see goodness um, contained in isolated acts of benevolence in Jesus, but we see it as a lifestyle expectation, as part of our relational experience, that you never more than a finger touch from the goodness of God, that you have an expectation all around you, no matter who you come into contact with, goodness is following you. Goodness and mercy are following you, and they're good. You can't shake these dudes off. They're trackers. They're tracking you down. God is hunting you down even as I speak. He's closing off all your avenues of escape. He is hunting you down for the express purpose of making you aware that you can have encounters and experiences with His goodness which are utterly compelling and life-changing. Not only that, anyone you connect with is going to get ruined by the goodness of God in you. Goodness is both a breakthrough encounter and an ongoing lifestyle in experience. Acts 10.38 says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. The power of God's goodness was so legendary towards His people 
that all of the nations round and about Israel would revere it and worship him. And the enemy would tremble because of it. Because they knew they could not overcome the goodness of God to Israel. They knew that Israel were highly favored, and they knew flat out they couldn't beat them in a fight. Because the goodness of God on their side was so powerful, it made them unbeatable. And nations trembled. In the book of Acts, it was said that the people who turned the world upside down, the goodness of God, oh my gosh, they've come here too. People had, nobody was neutral about the early disciples in the church. No one was neutral about them. It's, ah, well, you know, just a bunch of Christians. Now, now, these guys were rocking their neighborhoods with the goodness of God. No one was safe. Goodness has always been ever-present in all that God is and does. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, and it is also the fruit of light in our lives, Ephesians 5.29. Goodness is the fruit of light. That God wants you living in such incomparable goodness, it changes everyone that you come into connection with. Goodness creates a radiance of Christ that affects people. Goodness, therefore, is the true hallmark of every disciple. What you do in the goodness of God is incredible. No one is safe, not even your enemies. Bible says that a good man reveals the treasures of his goodness to the world, Matthew 12, 35. And he walks in a manner worthy of God's nature because goodness pleases the Lord, Colossians 1, 10. It's only when we commit ourselves to goodness that we truly come under an increase of knowledge and an upgrade of our experience of God Himself. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to get you to commit to goodness. Not as an idea, not as a concept, but as a lifestyle. That everything about you is governed by the goodness of God. That you can't scratch you, goodness is going to come out. Nothing works against you because goodness is going to pour out of you. It's going to come out of the pores of your skin. Not even your enemies, especially your enemies, are not safe. No one's safe. In fact, when you're traveling in the goodness of God, you don't recognize enemies. I had a guy come up to me in Kansas City and he said, I want you to know, I hate everything you stand for. He said, you're a heretic, you're apostate, you're a false teacher, I hate everything you stand for. And I'm against you, I'm your enemy. I said, dude, you're not. <laughs> Trust me on that one, you're not. He said, no, I'm being serious here, I hate everything you stand for. I'm your enemy. I said, no, you're not. He said, I am. I said, you do, you're not. <laughs> and he was getting really annoyed. He said, and he stamped his foot and said, I am. I said, dude, you can't be. He said, why? I said, it's Tuesday. <laughs> I don't take enemies on Tuesday. It's like, what kind of pelican are you? You didn't know that? And he looked at me, and he went bright red, and he went, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> I said, oh, that's good, because that's Wednesday. I have a special on Wednesday. <laughs> for people who want to be my enemy, I have a special. Yeah, come back tomorrow, I'll pray for you. You're not laying hands on me. I said, I don't have to. <laughs> Dude, you can't stop me praying. I go back to my hotel room and pray. It'll be the same result as if you were stood in front of me. But here's the thing, son. I'm not in the market for enemies. But thanks anyway, I appreciate the offer. <laughs> but you can't be my enemy 
unless I receive you as one. And I'm just not. I'm not in the mood. I haven't got the time. I'd rather have a cup of coffee with you. I'm not definitely not taking you as an enemy. But I'll pray for you for the goodness of God. So he just looked at me, shook his head and walked away. But I have a feeling I'll be seeing him. <laughs> you can't ever separate goodness from glory. So the Bible says that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I wonder if he's talking about, well, somewhere along the line you stop being good. You stop being amazingly good. You stop thinking about goodness as a way of life. Somewhere along the way you let go of something beautiful. You let go of goodness. I think we fall short of glory when we fail to practice goodness. Goodness is critical in times of opposition and warfare. We are to love our enemies and do good to them. Let me read you something else in the Bible. <laughs> Luke 6, <laughs> 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other one also. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. talking about a level of goodness here that transcends everything. A level of goodness so profound it literally doesn't matter what people are doing. Goodness is a way of life. To live in a place of such incomparable goodness that you're not scared about being taken for granted. You're not worried about being abused or your resources being abused. None of those things concern you. You're not concerned remotely about what other people do with the goodness that you put out. All you're concerned about is, I want to do good. I don't want to have favorites. I don't want to say, well, I'm not doing it for him and I'm not doing it for them and they'll only waste it and they'll only abuse it. It doesn't matter. Here's the thing about goodness. You can't be in charge of it. You don't get a say in who you give goodness to. You don't get to play favorites. You don't get to give goodness as a reward. You get to give it because that's the nature of God. And you don't get to give it with any conditions. Well, I'll, I'll do this if you do this. Uh, I mean, you wasted the last lot, so no more for you. You don't get to employ conditions. 
You don't get to play favorites. You get just to be good. We never suspend the power to do good in any circumstances of life. Goodness has an extraordinary power for the giver as well as the recipient. Years ago in my hometown in Southampton, there was a, a church leader and preacher. who was speaking against the prophetic in the city, and me in particular. So I think over the course of a year, he preached more about me than he did about Jesus. <laughs> and everything was, you know, don't go near him. If you see him walking down the street, cross over the road. Don't look into his eyes. Don't talk to him. You know... Uh, apparently, I was the second cousin three times removed from the devil himself. <clears throat> so everything was, you know, everything was against me, against me. I was doing schools of prophecy, and, and that made me an outlaw in some sections. So that was fascinating. And what began to happen over time was that the numbers in his, it's an independent church, the numbers in his congregation began to dwindle. I remember some of my friends at the time came and said, you know, his numbers are falling, so the income for the church is dropping. You know, God is judging him, you know, and like really glad about it. And I said, guys, that's not right. We can't think that way. You know, we want this guy to succeed. You know, he's a brother. If he's not behaving like one, that's got nothing to do with us. His own behavior is between him and the Lord. I'm not going to judge who he is. And I certainly don't want you being glad that he's failing. So we had some interesting conversations about that. And then a few months later, you know, his numbers are so low, his income is being affected. And I remember the Lord waking me up at 2 o'clock in the morning and saying, I want you to go to the ATM. I said, what? Are you short of cash? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, but, and he showed me this guy, no, but he is. So I get up at like 2.30 in the morning, go to the ATM, draw out a couple of thousand pounds, and then I have to drive around to his house with an envelope. And in England, we have the letterbox inside, in the front door, set in the front door. So you can put the thing right into the house, you know. So I'm tiptoeing down his garden path <laughs> at like 3 o'clock in the morning, kneeling down. I'm thinking, dear Lord, don't let any policemen come by right now because they'll never believe me, you know. And I put this thing, and the Lord said, put the money in. And, and, and I couldn't put my name on it or anything. And, and, but bless his house. So I'm speaking blessings through the letterbox <laughs> into his house and then flicking the money in, you know. And so like two or three times a month, the Lord would show me an amount and I would draw it out and I would be giving this guy money. And he begins waving banknotes in the air. See, the Lord is blessing my ministry. I'm right. <laughs> Which just was flat out funny. I laughed. That was so funny. <laughs> See, he's holding up the provision as a sign of God's vindication. That's just silly. <laughs> but it didn't matter to me that he got it wrong because eventually I knew he'd get it right because of God's goodness. Yeah? And it, the fascinating thing for me was that whole act of goodness saved me from an awful lot of anger and hassle and recrimination and all the stuff you really don't want to get involved in, you know? Because sometimes it's our response to things like that that, that really wears us out. You know, we just, if you engage negativity with negativity, you're not doing yourself any favors, really. So, 
But then I got a great opportunity uh, with him. Um, his daughter was in a car accident, and, and the thing is, he got such a poor reputation in the city that um, people were saying that his daughter's accident was a judgment from God. I know, I know, it's just bizarre how people think, eh? That God would actually lower himself. You know, you're talking a 14-year-old girl that God would lower himself to injuring a 14-year-old girl for the sake of teaching her stupid dad a lesson. You really think God is like that? You need your bumps red. <laughs> so... So people were saying, though, that's a sign from God. And so I found out where, the, where she was being, in which hospital she was in, and, and I went down. And I walked into the room, and, and he sat by her bed. And he looks at me, and he says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to pray for your daughter, man. I don't want someone like you praying for my daughter. I said, well, you know what? Looking around, I don't see too many volunteers. But you and I, you know, in Jesus, where two or three are gathered, they say, I don't trust you. I said, well, I trust you. And one of the things I'm trusting is that you're really not that dumb. That you wouldn't put your daughter's health at risk because of your supposed enmity with me. He said, there's nothing supposed about it. I said, dude, we're going to be praying in a few minutes. Lighten up. He said, I don't want to pray with you. I said, okay, I'll pray outside. But this is what I'm going to pray if you're interested. And so I went outside and I just stood there and in the corridor, and I'm praying. And the door opened, and he came out, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't know how to pray for her. I said, I know. Well, let's, let's just do it together, man. So we prayed. You know, and she's, you know, in a coma. Hey, but God is good. So pretty soon she wasn't. <laughs> but here's the thing. Those are the moments in goodness that make everything worthwhile. Prayed for a girl who was in distress and God heard our cry and released her. And I turned an enemy into a friend. Not a great friend. <laughs> but a friend. You know, we, you know, this is not Hollywood. We didn't become best buddies. But we could talk to each other. I could phone him up and say, how's it going? Like, I actually said to him one day, I said, so tell me something. Uh, what are you using for sermons now you can't hate me anymore? <laughs> and he laughed and he said, I'm just talking about Jesus these days. <laughs> you get moments with people and you only need a moment. You only need one moment with people. And really, I think maturity in the spirit is waiting for that moment and choosing it. But here's the thing. You are not defined by what other people do to you. You can only be defined by who God is for you. No one can make you angry. You can't say, well, he did this and he made me really angry. Come on. Nobody makes you angry. 
You chose to be angry. You chose it. No one made you do that. You could have chosen grace and mercy and kindness. Ugh, no, but you had to choose anger. What's that about? They didn't make you angry. Maybe they did something that caused the anger in you to rise. They didn't put anger in you. Maybe it was already there. Sometimes people only reveal to us the things we already have present. You know those people who get right up your nose? <laughs> they get on your last nerve. A guy just really makes me grind my teeth. Well, stop it because dentists cost a lot of money. <laughs> he makes me this. No, he doesn't. That stuff's already in you, man. You're choosing it. Stop choosing it and it'll leave. He'll go find some idiot, other idiot, who'll pick it up and use it. But you need to stop being the idiot. I'm talking to myself now. I hope, <laughs> hope you realize that. True disciples have a passion to prove what's good. They cleave, they cling to what is good. They're devoted to goodness. Because they see it as the only lifestyle that can truly represent the nature of God. For Christ's sake, we must abound in goodness. Be filled up with it. Be giving it away every opportunity. If you give goodness away, it will protect you in the giving. And you won't have to take on board all that negative stuff that other people's actions are pushing your way. You can repel that with goodness. You can learn to express his passion for generosity, to be lavish, to be profuse, to be extravagant in his loving kindness. It's a great thing. It's a, such a privilege to put things into the hand of God, to put resources, to put gifts into the hands of God. I love giving financially. I love putting money into the hands of God. I like giving. I, I like the nature of God. I like the generosity of God. I love the way that he thinks about us. You know, like anybody else in this room, I'm learning to be Christ-like in some of those things. All God's attributes of love, gentleness, grace, mercy, patience, and kindness, they're all acts that are rooted in his goodness toward us. So to walk in the Spirit is to be careful to maintain acts of goodness in our own lifestyle. It's not an option. It's the only viable expression of the kingdom. Every situation, every circumstance that we encounter is to be used to express the goodness of God. Everything that happens to us is a challenge to the Father's goodness in us and through us. So here's the point I want to make. What if we cannot be challenged by life, by oppositional people, or by the enemy? What if we can only ever be challenged by the goodness of God? What if everything in your life is just a challenge to God's goodness? If you accept it as a challenge from the enemy, then you have to do warfare. The enemy loves to draw you into warfare that is never going to go anywhere. 
that's just designed to weary you. You never fight the enemy on his terms. Just because he shows up rattling his sword against a shield doesn't mean you have to fight him. You fight him when God tells you to fight him. Sometimes the enemy shows up and he just wants to wear you out. But what he's really trying to do is distract you. Sometimes the enemy wants to distract you into warfare so that you miss the whole point of what's going on. He doesn't want you opposing him in the fruit of the Spirit. He wants you using your own energy to take authority over him so he can wear you out. He distracts you into a fight. You stay, your role is to stay and abide in Jesus. And you only fight when Jesus tells you to fight. You you have to have an order from the commander to fight. Just because the enemy shows up doesn't mean you should go charging across a field and engage him. You engage him when God tells you to engage him. The rest of the time you ignore him and you focus on Jesus. And the, the enemy is such a megalomaniac, he loves all the attention. He would love you to focus on him. I remember years ago when I was pastoring a church and God helped me. Actually, God helped them. And I remember I was in my office and I'm trying to write my talk for the next Sunday. And all I can hear from next door is, what's your name? Come out in the name of Jesus. And it's going on for like an hour and a half. So eventually I get up and I go out in the corridor and I knock on the door. Guy opens it. He's got his shirt undone. He's got his tie loosened. His sleeves are rolled up. He's all sweaty and red faced. And I said, dude, what are you doing? He said, we're casting out some devils. I said, well, I lost count at around 73. (laughs) And he went, yeah, it's pretty heavy stuff. I said, man, um, word of advice. It's a lying spirit. (laughs) He went, Gotcha, boss. Slams the door in my face. I go back into my office and I hear him say, Come out, you lying spirit. Ah! Peace. (laughs) What's your name? What's your name? Flipping thing was lying to him for an hour and a half. (laughs) All of your best moves are on DVD in heaven. You might be in the comedy section. Next to Mr. Bean. (laughs) That would be you. What if we can only ever be challenged by the goodness of God? Please don't get distracted into warfare. You only do what the Father is doing. If he's not going up against the enemy, in the Old Testament they would say, Shall I go up against the enemy? It's a viable question for the New Testament. Shall I go up against the enemy? Will you deliver him into my hand? God chose the moments of conflict. We don't choose them. Don't get distracted into warfare. Fight when God tells you to fight. But the fruit of the Spirit is a more potent weapon against the enemy than the gifts. Patience is a brilliant weapon. One of my practices is I am learning how to stay fresher for longer. To start every day fresh, 
So I don't want to carry anything from negative from yesterday into today. I want to end my day in celebration. Then I want to start fresh in the morning. I'm not letting the enemy accumulate stuff in my life. Talked to a guy the other week. said, oh, you know, this has been going on for a month. It's wearing me out. I said, dude, you do realize you can be fresh every day. You need to submit to a refreshing. Right now, you're submitting to a good kicking. And you're getting one. You should submit to a refreshing. New every morning is the goodness of God. It's the kindness of God. The compassion and the mercies of God. Start every day fresh. End every day with celebration. So you can start every day fresh. That's going to wear the enemy out. Because he's hoping that You know, it's back to that whole budget thing. The enemy likes you to accumulate weariness and tiredness. Because then you'll start saying things like, I'll be glad when this is over. Which basically means you're not going to be glad now. (laughs) Yeah, you're postponing gladness. I'll be glad when it's over. What if it's not going to be over for three more weeks? You're going to be miserable for three weeks? What are you thinking? You're postponing something. You're delaying your blessing. You're pushing your upgrade further away. Staying fresher longer is viable spirituality. But it's rooted in the goodness of God that you know that God is good. The enemy wants you to use your circumstances to challenge God's goodness. And God is saying, no, you take my goodness and you challenge your circumstances. You're being challenged to see my goodness. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter whether your situation is good, bad, or ugly. It can't stop, it can't separate you from the goodness of God. You're only being challenged by goodness. What does that look like for you? We're being challenged to live, think, speak, and act for the good in every circumstance. It absolutely doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It only matters what you're doing. It doesn't matter what their identity is, what's showing up. It matters what your identity is. It doesn't matter what they believe about you. It's about what you believe about God. It's a fun thing to write to some of my detractors and just say, hey man, I was thinking about you the other day and I felt the Lord just give me this word for you. hope it blesses you. (laughs) So far, no one's written back. (laughs) But you know, that's not the reward I'm looking for. The reward I'm looking for is the fact that I did it. I was Jesus in that situation. And I saved myself an awful lot of hassle. Yeah, it means I don't have to deal with their stuff. You never have to deal with their stuff. You just have to deal with your own. Yeah? Don't let the enemy fool you into dealing with somebody else's stuff. You just deal with your own. You live the way that you want to live. You are defined by who you want to be in Jesus and by who he is for you. That's a good place to live from. Romans 8.28 says that God makes all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. That means you love God in the situation you're in. Because remember we said every issue up front is never the issue. Everything's about relationship. So every single issue is about your relationship with God. It's about you knowing that you are the beloved and that you choosing to love God as a priority in that situation. And then when you've, when you've really settled, you've immersed your heart in love, then you come into alignment with the purpose of God in the situation itself. Because we all know that we've all faced situations that have not worked together for good. Right? Right? Because we didn't fulfill the conditions. 
to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose in the situation that you face. The first requirement in any set of circumstances is that you get into the face of God for the sake of love. Because He's pursuing you for the sake of love. For love is always on the agenda of God. That you are the beloved and you act like it. You get into His face, you receive love from God, and that gives you an anointing to see this situation differently and to become in alignment with His purpose in that particular instance. It's goodness that makes us radiant. It is your role in the earth to have a radiant idea of God and a radiant idea of the kingdom and a radiant idea of who you are in the affections of Jesus and a radiant idea of the church. And anybody who touches you gets touched by that brilliance. They get moved by you. Goodness makes us radiant. In goodness, we're always prepared. We're equipped. We're ready for God to do His best in every situation. So here's a question. Who around your life needs an encounter with goodness? In your family? In your friends? in your place of work, in your neighborhood? Who needs an encounter with goodness? Next question. Who is the most difficult person around your life? You may be married to him. I think my wife is. <laughs> Who's the most difficult person around your life? Practice. <laughs> what do you think they're there for? They are your shortcut into something brilliant. You're around them a lot. They're your shortcut. They're your blessing. That could be your giant that opens up some new territory for you. Hey, better the devil you know than the one you've yet to meet. (laughs) If you refuse this one, the next one could be a heck of a lot worse. Take what you can get. Practice on the dude you've got in front of you. Don't be trying to change him out for something else. You might get something worse. There's a reason why you're working in that company with that obnoxious boss. It is your shortcut into becoming Christ-like. Practice some goodness. What difficulties around your life need to be immersed in the goodness of God? In every situation, there is only one challenge facing you. It is the challenge of God's goodness to overcome everything in you and around you. You're only being challenged by the goodness of God. No matter how difficult, how hard, you're being challenged by goodness. Don't put the blame on somebody else. You're being challenged by the goodness of God. He's saying to you, the way into that person's life is my goodness. The way to overcome here is my goodness. The way to maintain who you are in the Spirit is through goodness. You're only being challenged by the goodness of God. But here's the thing. When you meet a difficult person, God is challenging you to bring a higher measure of good into their life than the difficulty they're bringing into yours. Yeah? He's saying, see that person? Their difficulty level rating is 7 out of 10 in your life. 
I want your goodness rating to be eight out of 10 at least. I want you to submerge their difficulty in my goodness. I want you to be at least as good for them as they are bad for you. But that's just a tie. That's no good. We want to win the championship. You don't win the championship through tying every game. Yeah, you want all the points. Yeah, you want to win. If you're in a fight, you should be in it to win it. <clears throat> so, who are the difficult people around you? You understand that they're there to upgrade you in goodness. They perhaps don't quite see it that way. But that's the purpose of God. That's why he sent them. That's why he allowed them. They are there to bring you into an upgrade of goodness. They're not there so that you can practice being an idiot. They're there for you to practice being Christ-like. They're there for you to practice the goodness of God in their life. Yeah, but he's obnoxious. Uh huh. Jesus passing through a village, everyone wants him to stay. He looks up in a tree and he sees this little guy called Zacchaeus. And Jesus knows exactly what's going on. That Zacchaeus is an obnoxious little rat <laughs> who has defrauded that whole community. And he singles out the one person in that whole community for a blessing. He chooses to demonstrate his goodness to Zacchaeus, the one who was least deserving got the goodness. So Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must eat with you this evening. It's, everyone wanted him to stay overnight and eat at their house, and he chooses Zacchaeus. An incredible honor. And Zacchaeus is overwhelmed by the goodness. And so Jesus moves on. And by the time Zacchaeus gets down out of that tree, he's not up a tree because he's small in stature and he can't see above the crowd. He's up a tree because he's a little rat. Everyone hates him. And if he stands still for more than five seconds in a crowd, someone's going to stick a knife between his third and fourth rib. He's up a tree for protection. By the time he gets out of the tree and scuttles up to Jesus' side, something's happened on the inside of him. And he just says, I want to, the first thing he says is, I want to give half my goods to the poor. And if, and the tense is, if and I have defrauded anybody, I'll pay them back four times as much. Jesus never said anything. He just demonstrated goodness. Can you imagine what happened the next day? The elders, you know, get a phone call in the morning. Can I meet you in the gate of the city? And they're all going, no. They're all texting each other. <clears throat> you know, the rat just called me. He wants to have a meeting. So all the elders are, what's, what's going on? I don't know. But they couldn't afford to ignore him because he was a powerful man. So they're all sat there thinking, this is going to be a great day. A brilliant day yesterday with Jesus, and now today we've got the rat. And so they see him with his entourage coming down, and two guys carrying this chest, and they're standing there, and they're normally used to Zacchaeus being arrogant and forceful and belligerent. And he just comes up, and they look at him, and there's something different about his face. And he just says... Um, I know I haven't been the kind of person that I should have been. But I really want to change. Anyway, um, there's no reason why you should believe me. But I, I just, um, this is half of everything that I own. I, I want you guys just to take it and share it around the community with any poor person. Um, anyway, I, um, I, I'm, I'm just going to leave it with you. And he walks away. And they're like going, what, is it going to be full of cockroaches or something? <laughs> so they open it up. It's full of money. And you can imagine them sitting down thinking, what the heck just happened? 
I wonder what Jesus said to him. He didn't look frightened, though. He looked peaceful. Huh. And all through that community, all through the day, people are getting a knock on their door. Imagine you're in, it's lunchtime, and you're just, you know, putting the stuff in the dishwasher. And you open the door, and there's the person you hate the most, who stripped you of any dignity and kept you poor, robbed you, and he's standing there, and you want to give him some five-fold ministry. <laughs> but you look at his face, and there's something you haven't seen on his face before. And he looks at you, and he just, and he just says, look, um, I did a great wickedness in your life, and I, I, I just want you to know I'm sorry, man. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I just, I, I want to be different. You know, I mean, I don't, I, I know, your history with me is not great. And I don't expect you to believe me. But anyway, I, 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 just, I want you to have this. And he hands you a bag and turns and walks away. You stand in there going, and you know it's money, you can hear the clink. And you shut the door and your wife comes in from the kitchen you know, drying her hands on a towel. Who was that? Zacchaeus. What did that little rat want? Well, he just apologized to me. He did what? He apologized for defrauding us. And he gave me this. And you pour the money out on the table. When you count it out, it's four times the amount that he took from you. And you're standing there with your arms around each other and you can't even hardly believe what just happened. And you say, what did just happen? Well, the kingdom happened. The king walked through your community and spread his goodness. And he chose the one man to give his goodness to. And then that man gave it away to everybody else in the community. And the worst person in your community is used to bring the whole level economically of that region up several levels. It's like the whole community won the lottery. What's that? That's goodness. That's goodness at work. It's not your job to judge who can receive goodness or to think, well, if I give him goodness and this could happen. You just do what the Lord is telling you to do. But you understand that from now on, your life is being challenged by one thing only, the goodness of God. Be the first to move in goodness and maintain the lifestyle. We are not worldly people. We're not. We're kingdom people. We don't repay evil with evil. We seek after what is good for one another and for all people. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 Seeking after everyone's good is the real challenge of our spirituality. It's goodness that puts our lives into alignment. We come into alignment with heaven and we release its resources. When we have a reputation for doing good, 1 Timothy 5.10, we become rich in goodness and God receives amazing glory. Our testimony of God's goodness creates a power and an authority to overturn all degradations of the enemy in the lives of people around us. We're only ever being challenged by goodness. No one is safe from the power of goodness. People will repent when they taste it. Not just random acts of kindness, but a lifestyle of bringing intentional goodness into the lives of people. Not doing a goodness hit you know, not a drive-by blessing. (laughs) 
Will we be taken for granted? Certainly. Will our goodness be abused? Count on it. Will people think we're foolish? Definitely. Here's the real truth behind all those impositions. Peter said, 1 Peter 3.13, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? In goodness, you cannot be robbed. You cannot be harmed. You cannot be defrauded. Because God is the one that resources your goodness. It's his money, it's not yours. Don't take it personally. Truth is, it doesn't matter if you are maligned. We're not doing it for results. We're not doing it for man's approval. We're doing it for the glory of God. We're being challenged by heaven to look at life through the lens of God's goodness. To see everyone and everything in the light of his goodness and mercy. We are a visual aid to the whole earth. They don't read their Bible, but they do read their Christians. We're a visual aid to the world so that they can touch heaven. We are the physical, tangible evidence that God is brilliantly, incredibly, astonishingly full of goodness. God is good. There is no higher truth and no better way to represent his glory than through goodness. Let's pray. Father, I pray for a fresh revelation of your nature in goodness. I ask that you would overtake our hearts with the goodness of God. That you would fill us with an overwhelming desire to walk in the goodness of God, to prove the goodness of God. That we would ourselves have continuous encounters with your goodness. That we would be fully persuaded about the power of your goodness in the earth. That you would change our lifestyle so that we have an ongoing experience of your goodness. That you would get hold of us in such a powerful way that our maturity will be defined by the goodness that we express. I ask, Lord, in this place for a radiant expression of the goodness and the glory of God to combine in our hearts so that our faces will shine And our lives will be brilliant. And people will see the brilliance, the glory of the light of your goodness. And that the fruit of the light of goodness in our life would be like a beacon in the darkness, cutting its way through to finding that person who is absolutely most in need of a transformation. That we would transform whole communities through being good just for the sake of it, just for the joy of it, just for the splendor of it. But I ask especially, Lord God, that we would leave this place knowing this truth. We can't be challenged by the enemy. We can't be challenged by circumstances. And we're not being challenged by oppositional people. We're being challenged by the goodness of God to see that goodness and to release it for the greater glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may that revelation take hold of us in such a powerful way that we will be transformed in his image. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it.